Good morning, I greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Very warm welcome to every one of you. Audrey, welcome. Ashton, Carlos, welcome. And uh, is uh, Raquel not here yet? No. Not yet, okay. So we're going to, um, can we, okay, before we do the offering, you know, nice to see you guys. I'm just reminded of something. I wish Raquel was here, but I'm sure she's going to come just now. But um, 17 years ago, I used to do a lot of work for Vodacom. They were one of the um, companies that I worked with in terms of wellness 17 years ago. And at that time, there was a young woman that came to me that had a problem conceiving. And I treated that young lady and prayed in the name of Jesus. And a child was born. Rihanna, is that Rihanna, eh? And by the way, that's Rihanna sitting in the back 16 years ago, the miracle child. God has brought him. I wish her mum was here, but she'll be here just now, I think. It's so wonderful to see him. I've seen so many, the many times I would go to places and I would see. Someone would tell me, you know, you prayed for me five years ago for a child, and there's a the child, you know. It's so wonderful, but this is 16 years ago. Okay. But anyway, let's take up the offering. Can you just pass the, uh, can I ask uh, Cindy if she can kindly pray for the offering as we take of the offering? Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity to serve you, my Lord, because you have done so much for us. Thank you, Father, for giving us the offering of the time that you will bless it to the church and that it will be used for the strength of our kingdom. Thank you, Master, for this opportunity to serve you again. Amen. Thank you. So before we, uh, well, we've got some kids here today, all right? Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, Samar, are you pushing it? Samar? Here, okay. Okay, so we weren't really very prepared for Sunday school today, and then we're going to try and start a bigger class in terms of the kids are growing up. So, um, we're looking at that in the near future. But, uh, so, Sunday school, can the kids and Samar, if you could, there's a party happening outside, if you can go. <laughs> You know, I look at Tatum, I look at uh, Carissa, and I, I don't know whether to even ask them to go, because they look so grown up. But nevertheless, where's your mom? Where oh, you guys came then? Okay, you can go outside. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're looking at, um, this, hopefully planning uh, a baptism, depending on if everyone's around. Um, on the on, on Easter Sunday, uh, but depending on the people that that want need to get baptized, um, if they are around, we're gonna we're gonna walk around it because always saying you know before it gets cold, it looks like it already started, but no, you know. So um, let us hear the word of God before we get there, and uh, but and kindly pray as the Lord opens our our hearts to the word. <coughs> Amen. So today, I was not supposed to be the minister, and uh, but I ended up now ministering. And then I look at the word that God has given me two weeks ago, actually. It was like a backup word, you know, for me, because I don't know when I was going to speak it. And I realized how appropriate it is. God knows exactly who's going to be here. You can see by the title, almost there. In reference to sometimes, it's like you're at the brink of something. It's right there. You see it, it's right there, but you can't seem to grasp it. I'm going to read from Deuteronomy 34, verses 1 to 4. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, that is, opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land from Gilead to Dan and all of Naphtali and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh and all the land of Judah to the western Mediterranean Sea and the south country and the valley 
called the plain in the valley of Jericho. And then the Lord said unto Moses, This is the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give this to your descendants. I have let, it, let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses now stood on the, it was called Mount Pisgah, at the edge of the promised land. The promised land we refer to sometimes as the land of Mulkanani. He looked, the man was traveling for 40 years towards it, leading the Israelites, but he never entered the land. If you know the, you know the word of God, which was on the screen, he says, I've let it you see it with your eyes, but you will not go there. He was rich, he was right there. A thing that he had been waiting for and walking towards for 40 years, but he was not allowed to enter it. And you wonder why. It's a sad case sometimes, the prevalent actually in today's world. Many a self-confessed believer in Jesus, they come so close to the breakthrough. They are right there. They can almost taste it, but they don't receive it. Or sometimes they just get enough, not the full portion. Everything is fine. You have enough money. You have sufficient peace. Everything kind of is okay, but you just don't get to that abundance. And you wonder when the Lord says, I will give you so much, your hands will not hold it. Where is this? So some background about this. The Israelites at that stage, when we read the scripture, they had been freed from Egypt for about 40, well, 40 years earlier. And those that left Egypt at that time, they escaped by the Red Sea. And we all know the story where Moses separated the Red Sea. There was about 600,000 men. If you count the women and children, the number was close to 3 million people. The physical distance from Egypt to the Promised Land was about 600 kilometers, Joburg to Durban. In fact, if they lined up from Egypt in a straight line, the first one, would, as they would be leaving Egypt, the last ones in the line would be touching the Promised Land. Now, in terms of travel, travel those days by foot, by the way, it would have taken about 11 days to travel to traverse that distance. 11 days. Today, you know, fastest time, maybe 45 minutes by airplane. But it took them not the 11 days, or 11 weeks, or 11 months. It took 40 years. That's incredible. Why did this happen? But just to give you some background, that's why I'm speaking about this part. The Bible is based on covenants. Even as we took the communion this morning, it was a covenant. We renewed our covenant to the Lord Jesus. There are many parts or many types of covenants. Originally, the Noah, the Noah covenant named after or the floods, but God promised I will not destroy people again. He made a promise, a covenant. It's like an agreement. Then the Abrahamic covenant came, the promise to Abraham, when God said to Abraham, I will make you a great nation. And he can give that nation a promised land. And then there was the Davidic covenant. And then when God freed the Israelites from Egypt, which we just read about coming from Egypt and going through the, through the Red Sea to the promised land, which took 40 years, he was keeping his, the Abrahamic covenant which was going to make them a great nation. And on the way to that time, as they walked towards the Promised Land, the Mosaic Covenant was formed, which we still, still kind of follow today. And that is in Deuteronomy, or the blessing spoken about Deuteronomy 1, 28 verses 1 to 14, which the Mosaic Covenant says, Obey, and you're blessed. If you don't obey, you don't get blessed. Simple. So to put it in perspective, the Israelites at that time, they were slaves for 400 years. They were in captivity. They only got a slave's reward, which is far, far better than you'll treat even, far worse rather than you'll treat even your helpers today. You remember a slave had no rights. They were born in slavery. Generations of them were born. And then God freed them. All the bondages were broken. They were led out by Moses to the promised land. And on the way there, the Lord made the covenant or the agreement the Mosaic Covenant, which he said, which still applies today. Obey me and I'll bless you. Disobey and you won't see the blessing. That is all that is required. In fact, that is all that is required today. Just obeying God, nothing else. In fact, God spoke about it, he confirmed it in the book of Jeremiah hundreds of years later. He said, burnt offering and sacrifice I do not need. When I brought you out of the land of Egypt, I did not speak to your fathers or command them. Sorry, let me put that up. or command them to burn, concerning burnt offerings or sacrifice. But I gave them this, obey my voice and I will be your God, you shall be my people, and walk in all the way that I command you, that all may be well. Now of the two million Israelites, 
two million endowed Israelites that left Egypt. Two million, that's a lot of people. Only two of them, two, just two, out of two million actually entered the promised land. Everyone over 20 years old that left Egypt passed away before they entered. That's a tiny fraction. And this journey, which as I said, took 11, could have taken 11 days to 40 years. And the Lord allowed them to wander around and around until almost all died and only two were allowed to enter. Now, it might seem unusual, but it's really not when you think about it. Sometimes many Christians or believers are the same. You're wandering all around. You know there's a promise that you're going to get to a great blessing of the promised land. You come to the Lord Jesus, you're bound. Many people are bound. Generational curses, sin, whatever. Jesus sets them free. The next thing is to receive the blessing spoken about in Deuteronomy 28. And you're walking towards the promised land. But it's like years and years and years go. You don't get there. And that's what our focus is always in this ministry, to take you to that area. To break the curses and do all those things. There's one vital component that always needs to be done. And that is obedience without question. The biggest, biggest attribute of a Christian, bigger than anything else, more than sacrifice, you can fast and pray as much as you want to. You can be as holy as you want to. You can dress it, look it, speak it. If you don't obey, it carries no weight. And that's why when people fast and pray, it's a good thing, but it's merely sacrifice. It's counterproductive unless it's underlined or grounded in obedience. No matter what you do, if you don't obey your fasting and your praying, it will make no difference. And we know the famous scripture about where Samuel said, and to Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. I put up on the board when he spoke about Sam, uh, Saul partially obeying. And Jeremiah, which we just read, where the Lord says, I'm not interested. I didn't ask you about burnt offerings and sacrifice. Obey, and I will be a God, and you will be blessed. The Lord always em emphasizes obedience. Obedience, as we say, we can say is the deal breaker or the covenant breaker. And disobedience can bring you to the point where you can come right to it, as you'll see just now with Moses. You're standing right in front of this big, big thing. And you can't re get it in your hand. You never receive it. Sometimes we call it incomplete breakthroughs or not full-term breakthroughs. Sometimes we refer to it as the spirit of Pisgah because it happened on Mount Pisgah. You get so excited that everything is happening or falling into place. But it never quite happens. And that, why, that would explain why many Christians or believers in Christ, they never experience the full potential of the blessing that is spoken about in Deuteronomy. They may be fasting, praying, even seeking God as best as they could. But some area in their life relating to obedience is the root cause. Now, they have a covenant with the Lord Jesus to believe, to love, and to obey. I'm not talking about a religious person who looks the part, talks the part, dresses the part, prays the part. It's far deeper than that. God looks what's inside your heart. If you're not walking in obedience, so your blessing is ampered, as we just read. But there are other factors which we're going to come to now. So Moses now, <clears throat> as we read, he came to the promised land, <clears throat> excuse me, but he never went in. He wasn't allowed to enter. Now when you think about Moses, Moses as a man was a very powerful prophet. The man wrote the Torah, which is the Jewish Bible, or the first five books of our Bible is the Jewish Bible, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Moses wrote that. He was revered as a mighty, mighty man of God. He raised his staff, and the Red Sea split. He led the Israelites for 40 years, millions of people. Why would God deny him this? The man did so much. In Luke 12, 48, many of us would know the scripture where it says, For everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. To whom they entrusted much, God will ask much more. That's why we say is, as ministers of God, we come under harsher judgment because God requires more from us because he's given us more in respect of that area. So the reason why Moses came right to the brink of the promised land and he never entered it, you'll find the reason in Numbers 20 verse 9. I'm going to read that quickly. 
Numbers 20, 20 verse 9, the Lord told Moses that they came to a point where they had no water. And the Lord told Moses, take the rod, you and your brother, Aaron, Aaron, and assemble the congregation and speak to the rock that was in front of them. And when you speak to the rock, it will pour out water. And in this way, you shall bring water to the rock and let the congregation and the livestock drink fresh water. And then Moses said, Moses and Aaron gathered up the assembly before the rock. And then Moses said unto them, I'm trying to put this in the street. And Moses said unto them, he called the people, he said, listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock? And Moses raised his hand in anger. And with his rod, he struck the rock instead of speaking to it as the Lord had commanded, and the water poured out. And the congregation and the livestock drank water. But then the Lord said to Moses after he did that, because he told Moses, speak to the rock, and Lord Moses struck it. He said, because you have not believed or trusted me or treated me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, you therefore shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. So God told them, because I told you speak to the rock and you struck it, I'm not going to allow you to enter the promised land after 40 years. How could this be? Well, it might seem like a very harsh judgment when you look at it. Remember now Moses was leading these people for 40 years. He was tired of their grumbling and their complaining. When the Lord said, speak to the rock and the water will come out, Moses in irritation and anger, he got cross to them, he struck the rock and as he said, the water came out. And God was not pleased. It might seem a simple mistake. But there are certain things that Moses did here that was actually far bigger than what we perceive as a small mistake. And God did not overlook it. But as we said originally, the caliber of Moses, because much was given to him, much was required of him. And Moses never entered the promised land. So we can look at what he did that brought it to the same point. And remember, as I said, only two people entered the promised land out of two million adults. The rest died before they got there. Now, the Abrahamic covenant, um, which I spoke about, God waited until, but God always keeps his word. When he said, I will take you to the promised land, it's not like he broke his word, he waited until that generation had passed when he took the next generation in. He always keeps his word. So the Israelites, they sinned greatly, as we know, they practiced idolatry, they murmured, they groaned, they complained, they turned against God. And their disobedience prevented or robbed them from their blessing, and they never entered the promised land. But the question is, why did Moses, who did so much right things, entered, not enter, he was right there. And that, sometimes we look at it as, like ourselves, you are with God. You are seeking the right things, the better things, maybe even fasting and praying. You know, I say this, and I'm not discouraging people about coming to church. We too often judge people when we see them. But let me put it this way. Not everyone that sits in church every week is a Christian. And not everyone that's not going to church out there every week is not a Christian. We should, be, we should love to be in the fellowship of God. But sometimes people just come for religious reasons. If you feel you're stagnating or you're not growing, you've come to the edge, come in, come in, I'll come, to the edge of your breakthrough, but you never experience it. Sometimes you feel like you're limited and you can't pass a certain level. You come right to it. It's like you've been waiting and waiting and you see this, the potential there. Many years go by, 40 years sometimes. And nothing is really happening and you wonder what is going on. It's like you're almost at the blessing, but you can't quite reach it. You feel you, you are limited. It's like you can only go so high. You hit a glass ceiling. You look at others getting blessed and other businesses, for example, prospering. And you wonder what's going on. You sometimes think, ah, maybe God likes that man and not me. And if you're in this position, you may not be starving. You have enough, actually. But you don't get the abundance. You're reaching for much more and you can't get there. And if you look at the mistakes that Moses made, 
that caused the problem. We came right to the brink of the greatest blessing on the, in the history of the Israelite nation, the land of Mokanani. But he could not step in. Firstly, Moses disobeyed. All along goes Moses obeyed in everything. But at the very last minute, he disobeyed. In fact, he obeyed partially. We're going to talk about that just now. Then the next thing, Moses got angry. Thirdly, he took glory for himself. <coughs> and fourthly, ignorance. He was ignorant of something. He struck the rock instead of speaking to it. That one requires some explanation, which I'm going to get to that just now. But before we get to that, if you find or discover that your breakthroughs are just evading you, they're incomplete, or you just don't get there, and to your knowledge, you've tried everything, you need to know and remember that routine must change. Routine has to break and change for change to happen. For example, if you add, if you add two and two, you get four. But if you want to get to five, you can't keep on adding two and two because you'll always get four. If you want five, which is changed, then you must add something else, two and three, for example. You can't do the same things all the time and expect different results. It's impossible. That's why New Year, New Year resolutions fail. You fire up the beginning of January, saying, I want this, that, that, that. But you do exactly the same thing and nothing will change. Something needs to change for change to happen. So this whole incident about Moses as it happened on Mount, Mount Pisgah, the final view that Moses had to see the land of Canaan or the promised land. And we refer this, refer, <coughs> excuse me, to this um, as a spirit of Pisgah, which is operating in someone's life when this happens, when they come right there, but they don't get it. Excuse me, it's descriptive of a condition where you come to the brink of your breakthrough, but you never experience it or you never taste it. It's sometimes called the spirit of limitation. It's like you only go so far. Incredible success eludes you. Or you experience incomplete breakthroughs instead of full-term breakthroughs. You know, I say this often when you're in trouble, always look up where God is. God is the one that will help you. Psalms 121 verse 1 says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills where my health come from. Always, I get sometimes weary of Christians who say God is not answering, or God is not helping, or he does not care. If they say that, they don't know him. God is the answer. And we used to sing a song those days, Jesus is the answer. And he has your answer. And if you've been looking for an answer as to why you feel limited in your business, in your life, in your breakthroughs, in your finances, in your career, in whatever area, you're almost there, but you never quite reach it. When you seek God, he speaks to you. And he speaks in many ways. And today, through this word, he's speaking to you. But you need to address the change and make a change. So as we said originally about the covenant of the, of the Mosaic covenant, your part is obeying. Lord, I obey you. God's part, I pour the blessing to you. I bless you. Whenever you're stagnating or you're not moving forward, or you're just not getting there, we're not getting in. Examine your lives to ascertain where there's a problem. And the best person to examine your life is you. No one likes to be told by another human being, you are wrong. Examine yourself. One of the, the, the hallmarks of David, you know David? People love David. He was a man that worshipped and prayed. He was a warrior and a worshipper. But the man, if you look at his life, was a big time sinner too. But they love him because David, and God even said he's after my honor, because David always judged himself and looked inwards. So the key is to break the spirit of limitation or being almost there. We're going to look at what Moses, the mistakes Moses made, so we don't make the same mistake. The first part is partial obedience or disobedience. If you look at what we define obedience, it's doing what pleases God. It's more important than fasting or any sacrifice that you may make. In fact, all that fasting and prayer does is positions you, brings you to a position where you're able to receive. And fasting kills your flesh, so your spirit rises. Don't get me wrong, fasting very often proof, um, produces results, but it must be accompanied. It's what is a fasting and prayer and obedience. Fasting and prayer in a disobedient person automatically normally brings them to a place of conviction. 
and reminds them. You know, when the Lord Jesus was asked in Matthew 22, 36, yes, he was asked, what is the most important commandment? I find myself the last three weeks saying the same scripture. They asked him, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And the Lord said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That is the first and the most and the greatest commandment. Loving God is your greatest commandment. It's your strength, actually, your greatest strength. Because when you love God, you fully obey. And when you obey, you are blessed. You cannot say, even in the natural, that you love your wife or your husband and do everything that they don't like. I'm not saying obey, maybe. You will naturally do things that please them. And the Bible, the Lord says, if you love me, you'll obey me. So though we, you know, we falter and fail, none of us are perfect, we all falter every day. Okay, I'm big on repentance, as I've always said it, and I find myself in repentance twice a day at least. And every time I'm in repentance, I'll always, there'll always be something that God has reminded me. You did this today, or you did not do this today. So we all falter and fail, but we repent and we continue walking. We should always be striving towards obedience or seeking after righteousness, as we said last week, or being in right standing with God. So we should be daily examining ourselves daily to see if you're doing the right thing. And it's not rocket science, you don't need to have a degree in theology to know when you're doing the right or when you're doing wrong, you just know it. Now Moses partially obeyed by looking to the rock for water. He did the right thing, but he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. Okay, I'm going to come back to God, God said speak and he struck it. I'm going to come back to what, why that was a big thing. And the second problem with Moses, and this is a common thing with many, many people, anger. The man was so fed up with all these people. He was leading three million people who were messing up all the time. And he was fed up of them. He had become angry with them. Now God says we must be imitators. The Bible says we will be imitators of God. And in this respect, as he forgives you, so should you. No matter what you do, how wrong you may be, you can murder someone. If you truly repent and God will forgive you, and we as human beings, we expect to be forgiven. We want God to forgive us. But if you can't forgive another person, it's a blockage. It's a blockage to your complete blessings if you don't. And when you open the door and not forgive, and like Moses become so fed up with someone that's always doing the wrong thing against you, for example, or complaining and murmuring and groaning and moaning, though you try to help them all the time, and you get cross to them, it's human, but it opens the door. It's a dangerous place to be. Anger opens the door. If you look at our prayer programs, we always tell you, guard against anger. Anger opens the door. It opens the door to the enemy. And I'm thinking of incidents that happened to me in the past where just because of anger, the enemy walks in. So Moses could not forgive, forgive them because he knew God. He knew the goodness of God. He knew the love of God. And he could see these people being so ungrateful, disobeying, complaining, grumbling against the God that he loved so much. And it caused anger to well up on him, and he reacted in anger, and that anger caused him now to disobey. He cut him off from his ultimate blessing. Anger is a big problem. Now we all, there's no one can tell me you don't get angry. Every one of us. Every one of us, at some point, we kind of lose it. But when you lose it, the problem, the Bible actually says, be angry and don't sin. Anger leads to sin. So Moses now got so cross with them, he disobeyed by striking the rock and of speaking. And the man was walking for 40 years. 40 years of walking is a long distance. And he did not enter the land which God has promised him. Anger can, unforgiveness which leads to anger can stop your blessing and instructs. Many people don't realize it. It will stop you if you can't forgive any program, prayer program that we do or anything. In fact, publicly, Matthew 5, 23, the Lord Jesus said, if you're offering your gift at the altar, if you're going to God, and you remember that your brother has something against you because you've done something wrong to him or he's done something wrong to you, but you have a problem with him, with each other. 
stop, leave your gift at the altar and go back. Make peace with your brother first and then come back and present your gift. Because if you don't, your prayers won't be answered. Unforgiveness is like drinking one's own poison and hoping the other person dies from it. It just makes you more miserable. And unforgiveness, eventually, you know, sometimes when you can't forgive someone that hurts you, and that person now goes to God and makes right, and God forgives them, and they get blessed. And now you look at this person, and it makes you angry. How can this person now, who did all this wrong, be so blessed? Unforgiveness, unchecked, is dangerous. It can establish, and eventually bitterness arises. And that causes more trouble. So guard against unforgiveness, which often leads to anger. And it's a problem. We all have anger issues at some point. But it's to bring it under control. It's dangerous. It can, sheesh. I'm thinking of an incident in chat said where I come from. A friend of mine, his son. One day, we had chatted a few guys in the township. So it's, uh, yeah, like Wild West sometimes. So... On a Saturday night, two guys were fighting on the road, and this guy, for no reason, came up out of anger, looked at them and got cross. Cross, cross because they were making kind of a racket in front of his house. He took out a gun and he killed one of the guys. Killed him. The anger caused him to commit murder. And I remember his dad coming to us. Anyway, Given South Africa what it is, they managed to set him free. Uh, but anger caused him to commit murder. It's a dangerous thing. The next problem or the next um, mistake that Moses made, and that sometimes happens to us, is we're taking glory for yourself. Where sometimes, and this happens by the way, where you become so blessed. Remember, you know, people who will attest to this businessman can tell you. You can sometimes go from zero to 1,000 in a week. And by the same token, it can go away just as fast. But sometimes when your blessing becomes so much, it becomes a lot. Everything changes. Your focus sometimes can shift to the blessing rather than the source of it. You forget who gave it to you. You start thinking and you're talking like it's your ability. You know me, I've been doing this for a very long time, huh? I've been doing this business for many years. I'm very connected. I know what to do. I have the contacts. I'm very sharp. You start thinking it's your ability that made it happen. Deuteronomy 8 verse 18. I don't have it on the board. God says, it is I that has given you the ability or the power or the skills to acquire wealth. It comes from God. Without him, you can do nothing. So sometimes your blessing in certain people can make you make them start bless or glorifying their own abilities. They think, ah, it is me. I've met people. I have actually met someone recently who said, I well, will use the word. All the things that I have, it's not from God. It is me. I work hard. Actually, about a month later, the man called me to come pray in his house. But besides that, glory belongs to God. And a good way to not get misled in this area, because sometimes it happens. Blessings can, can overwhelm you and you can get... You know, if you ask most people, could you do with 10 million rands now? I don't know anyone that would say, ah, yeah, no, no, I'm sorry, eh, please, don't give me that money. Very few would say that. When God blesses you, he knows how much to give you. He knows when to give you. He knows how much you can handle. Like how you know your child. You don't give your child things that, that he can't handle. No matter how much the child cries for it. Now, I was telling someone the other day, I did speak about this a couple of years ago. One of the biggest lotto million, millionaires in the US was a person that won 200 some odd million dollars. That's a ton of money. Billionaire by our standards. After two years of winning the money, when he was interviewed, he said, my greatest regret was winning that money. I wish I'd never won it. But in that two years, two of his daughters or two of his children had become drug addicts because of the huge exposure of, to the money and overdosed and died. 
When God gives you a blessing, there's no sorrow attached to it. So sometimes a way to understand or to remember it comes from God is to thank Him. That's what the Bible says, thank Him in everything. Our daily prayer should be, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. Thank you for what you've given me. Thank you for this. As long as you are regularly thanking God, then you will always be reminded of where the blessing comes from. Beware of taking glory for yourself. Because I've seen this. As fast as it comes, it can go. No matter how strong you think your financial position may be, it can go, it go in a flash. It can go in a flash. The so self-glory, that's another mistake of Moses. And the last mistake, sheesh, I, I'm, I'm going very quick today, man. Okay, the last one, but this is a big one, ignorance. Ignorance or the lack of knowledge. No man will be justified for being ignorant. For ignorant, ignorance is never an excuse. And many people suffer from it with regard to God's word. If you're a tourist in another country, for example, and you break the law because you did not know it was wrong to do that particular thing in the country, and they arrest you and they take you to court, and you tell the judge, sorry, I did not know it was wrong to do that. He will not give you a break. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. The judge will still convict you. As Christians, we have the word. It's our duty to know the word. The word is everywhere. Bibles are available all the time. We can't plead ignorance. But how does it apply to Moses? So God told Moses, he said, Moses, speak to the rock. Moses, in anger, frustration, irritation, he took his staff and he struck the rock. Now, why was this such a big deal? You see, Moses was not aware at that time that the rock that was at that time throughout the journey was actually a representation of the Lord Jesus. The rock in the whole testament was a representation of the Lord Jesus. And that you'll find in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 1 to 4. Let me read 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 to 4. It says, For I do not want you to be unaware believers that our fathers were all under the cloud in which God's presence went with them and they all passed miraculous, miraculously and safely through and they were baptized into Moses his safekeeping as a leader in the cloud and all of them ate the same spiritual food the fourth first and all of them drank the same spiritual drink for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them new testament eh? and that rock was christ for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them that's the rock they're talking about and that rock was christ that rock that moses struck was a representation of jesus now moses confusion could have been this you can't say i can understand the man because before this there was this time where the israelites also had a problem and they had no water and uh, that you'll find in the book of exodus so they came to a point no water and the lord told moses he said i will stand before you by the rock of, at Oreb. and the lord told moses take your staff and strike the rock and water will come out and that's what happened and later on as we just read our original scripture then the lord chose jesus uh, sorry god told Moses, now don't strike the rock, speak to the rock. Now Moses had no idea that this was a representation of Christ. He had not met Jesus, except later in the transfiguration. But the point I'm trying to make, and this is why it was so, was not a good thing. You can't strike Christ the rock twice. Moses had no idea that this was Christ the rock. He did not even know Jesus. He was ignorant. But God did tell him, don't strike, speak. And this applies to us today. With regard to Jesus, as we come to the Easter weekend in two weeks' time, the Lord Jesus was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. And he said, it is finished on Calvary. He was struck at that time. At the crucifixion, it was done and he said, it's finished. Now you don't crucify Christ again. Again, you speak to him. Christ was struck once. Now you don't strike him again. You speak to him through his Holy Spirit. You don't strike Jesus by doing anything to persecute him. Remember Paul who was once called Saul and he was persecuting the Christians. He was attacking them. 
He was killing them stoned to death. And one day the Holy Spirit arrested him and Jesus appeared and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? When you affect or you attack another member of the body of Christ, you're attacking Jesus. You're putting him through the same thing again. If you're faced with someone that has a problem, then please, we all have problems with people. If you don't, even Jesus had problems, so you must have. Everyone, their people are, if for lack of a better word, people today are faulty. They give you trouble. Don't attack them. Take it to God in prayer. You never know. You may be wrong and you just can't see it. Or maybe that person would have so much of wrong, repented and got forgiven. And now you come against him, you are coming against Jesus. Don't come against another believer. No matter what wrong they do, take it to the Lord in prayer. That was one of the mistakes that Moses made. He struck the rock. Instead of speaking, when you attack your fellow brother and sister, thinking you are so righteous, you can negate your own righteousness. And when you do that, you're actually striking Jesus. When you come against, when someone comes against you, Jesus lives in you, they attack Jesus. When you do the same to another, that's what you're doing. You're actually putting Jesus back on the cross when the work has actually been finished already. And it will hold back your blessing. You will see it right in front of you. And you can't reach it. Now Moses, remember, did not know the word. Today we have no excuse. We have the word. The Bible is all over the place. There's Bibles in the back there if you want one, by the way. Get to know the word. Because knowledge will place you ahead of everything. And the knowledge comes from the word of God. Increase your word, your knowledge through the word of God. I've only been to Bible school for about two months in my life, by the way. I never studied. Really. I would always pray and pray and pray until God speaks. It can be frustrating sometimes, but the Holy Spirit will teach you, so we've got no excuse. Read the word, hear the word, and do what it says. And that's what's happening right now. We're imparting knowledge to the word. The only antidote to ignorance is your ability to receive the word or receive knowledge via the word, and you use it. Read the word daily. So to break the spirit of limitation or the spirit of almost there, let's look at what Moses did or didn't do. And watch that you don't do it. Examine yourself closely daily to gauge yourself in terms of obedience. Are you really walking right? Don't look at pleasing anyone except God. You know, the Holy Spirit lives within us. You know. You know when you're doing right, you know when you're doing wrong. It's something inside you. No one can go there and shoot someone and say, ah, I just was in a bad mood today. I didn't know I was doing wrong. Not acceptable. You know inside you, I have done wrong. So the Holy Spirit speaks to you. So when you do wrong, the Holy Spirit speaks to you. Walk in obedience. And be careful if you don't forgive those that wrong you. Because the enemy can use that to make you cross. And when you get cross, it's a problem. It blocks your blessing. Many, many years ago, for those of you who've been, been here long enough, I've said this in the past, when I was called to a, um, a place to, to do a treatment on someone, and I went there in a very foul mood. Many years, I was in Pinetown, I had practiced there at that stage, and I was in a very bad mood. I remember driving up Marino, and I got to this place. I did a treatment on a group of people. It was actually a temple. And I remember the one guy that I was doing this treatment, when I looked at him, I just didn't feel right. But I was really cross for something silly too. I don't remember what it was. And little did I know that that spirit that was in that person looked at my anger and saw an open door and came into me. I didn't know it. I just went back, finished what I do, was doing in a bad mood. It was a Friday night, Friday afternoon. When I got back home to Chatsworth in that evening, that spirit manifested in me. That demon started to show. I remember vaguely what was going on. I remember acting very weird. And my late wife said, I've got someone to pray on the phone. And I remember this thing going, I was angry enough to open a door. And this said, which said, welcome. And he came in. No matter how spiritual, no matter how good I thought I was, beware of anger. Anger is a big problem. Anger steals. I've always seen them. Anger steals. 
So forgive those that wrong you. And the quickest way to diffuse anger, forgive them. You bring more harm to yourself anyway. As I said, it's like drinking poison. And then thanking God. You know, if you really consider what God has done, if I look back on my life, I could thank God just tons of things. I've been through a lot. Even health-wise, I've been through a lot. I've been through a lot. I remember when I was 39 years old, 19 years ago, I was a, in a cardiac ward in, in case that in the youngest person in the ward with the most massive heart attack. And they could not understand this. And I remember seeing a vision where God picked me up and leaving all that. And I look back and I think, Lord, 19 years ago, I have no trace of it now. The heart muscle never can't re, um, repair itself. You go for the ECG 20 years later, you'll see it. There's no trace of it. I've got much to thank God for my health, my mind, my finance. I was an epileptic. I was a bad epileptic. I have grand mal seizures. I never gave a speech in metric, up to metric, ever. Because I wouldn't get one word out. The teacher would give up on me. Uh, now, I don't even call this guy because I stuttered and stammered continuously. I was a good English student, so they liked me, but don't even call him to give a speech. Never gave a speech. God, I've got so much to thank you for. That's only that part. What about the finances? What about the business? What about lots of things? So thank God. All the time I've come to realize that it's not my so-called bright mind, I think. It's only God. Only God can do this. And lastly, never attack someone, especially a child of God, that confessed child of God, who can say, I believe in Jesus. When you're attacking him or her, you are coming against Jesus. You're coming against Jesus. Rather pray about it. Anyone, you can take them down, pick them up, lift them up, all with prayer, all with prayer. Let us close our eyes. Father, we thank you for your word that has come forth this, this morning, Lord. And I bring, Lord, as we address the spirit of limitation, the spirit of almost day, that satanic force that causes us to have breakthroughs that are not full term, that same spirit that was found upon the Mount of Pisgah as Moses stood and looked upon the promised land and could not enter. That same spirit is prevalent today that tries to attack your children using our weaknesses and our force. Convict us, Holy Spirit, that we will walk in obedience in all that we say and we do. And Lord, caution us about the spirit of religion. That no matter what we look at, look like, no matter what we sound like, no matter where we stay, that our obedience will come from our heart. Convict us, O oh Lord, that we will examine ourselves daily. Daily look at ourselves to understand where we've gone wrong. Bring us to a point, Father, that we would forgive others as you have forgiven us. That no matter who has harmed us, no matter what wrong they've done, no matter how much we've helped them, yet they've turned and put a knife in our back. Help us, O oh Lord, and give us the strength to forgive and release them. That we will harbor no anger, Lord. For we know anger steals, anger is an open door. We will harbor no anger, Lord. And Father God, help us, O oh Lord, that we would not be ignorant, ignorant of the words. For you are the word, Lord Jesus. And from the time we come to you and we give our hearts and confess that we believe in you and we have a covenant with you, you reside through your Holy Spirit inside us. Your word lives in us. Convict us, O oh Lord, and speak into our minds and give us revelation when we read your word. It will jump out at us. That your word will teach us about the word itself. That we will understand, we will know that we would have revelation. I release the spirit that is spoken about in Ephesians 1.17. Holy Spirit, give us wisdom and revelation, every single one of us, that we would move to a new level, a higher level in the understanding of the word of God. 
Help us, O Lord, to be thankful all the time, O Lord. That we will thank you. We know, Lord, you are the author and the finisher of our faith. We take not one breath without your blessing. Every breath that we take, every beat of our heart is only because of your grace. You could decide any time to stop us from breathing, to stop our hearts from working. It is by your grace we live. For everything that we have from our families, to our businesses, to our finances, to our children, to our jobs, to our careers, to our health, to everything, it is only because of your grace. Let us not forget that you are the God that loves us and sustains us and keeps us and supplies our needs and gives us our heart's desires, O Lord. And I pray, Lord, the word that has been delivered today, Lord, I speak it into the hearts of those that are here right now. Let it be embedded and sown into the heart. Let it inspire. Let each and every one of us leave this place inspired, knowing, Lord, that before us is this great land of milk and honey, this great abundance, this massive blessing. As we stand before it this morning hour, and as we address those things, that mistakes that Moses made, convict us that we will not make the same mistake. That each and every one of us here declare in the name of Jesus that we will step into the land of milk and honey. Today, Father, we will cross over the Jordan River, our local Jordan. Today, O oh Lord, we will step into the land of milk and honey, the land of great abundance. Convict us and teach us. Father, for those of your children that are currently in the middle of the prayer program, lead them as they walk through this road of deliverance, that they will come to a point. They will remember this day, the day that God intervened and God spoke and everything changed. And I speak and remind the spirit realm right now. Every force of wickedness, every entity, everything that is evil, every witchcraft force and agent of darkness, anything that is not of God, be warned in the name of Jesus as I raise the rod of Moses, the rod of deliverance, and I come against you in the name of the Lord. I thank you, Lord, as your children walk through, they will come out purified and shining. They will come out refined and blessed. Every one of them that are on the program right now, Lord, when people look upon them in a short while, their blessing will shine. They will see it. It will be evident in their lives in their business, in their health, in their finances, in their children, in their homes, in everything that the glory of God shine through, Father. I thank you, wonderful Savior. I thank you for the blood of Jesus. Lord, as we come to this time of year, as we approach the Easter period, the holiest time, Lord, when death died, when we have attained the greatest victory, prepare our hearts and our minds for that time, O oh Lord. And I pray over each and every one of you that the Lord may bless you and the Lord may keep you as I declare the ironic blessing over you. The Lord may protect you. The Lord may sustain you. The Lord may guard you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you with amazing, amazing favor. And the Lord be gracious to you, surrounding you with loving kindness. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you with divine approval and give you shalom. Amazing, amazing peace. And the grace of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that amazing grace, that amazing grace be your portion. And the love of God, that Father, that wonderful love that we will never understand fully, be upon you and flow through your life. And the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, the mighty Holy Spirit, be your portion as the blood of Jesus covers you. I thank you, Lord. As the word has been sown, I speak that word, be revived, be watered, and grow and produce fruit in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you.